I'm lucky enough to live in Oxford, one of the most beautiful cities in the south of England. But just occasionally, I long to head off somewhere new. Where this time? Ah, yes, Jordan. Perfect. The Jordan Top 5 must-do list runs like this. Number one, Petra, the Rose Red City. Number two, Wadi Rum, the magnificent valley at the heart of Lawrence of Arabia Land. Number three, a float in the Dead Sea, so salty it's impossible to sink. Number four, a sojourn in Amman, the White City. And number five, Aqaba, Jordan's only port and beach resort. Now that's the one that comes as a surprise to most foreigners. Certainly did to me. Situated on the northernmost corner of the Red Sea Inlet, Aqaba is Jordan's most southerly city, with an impressive natural harbour and a tropical sea ecosystem. Beautiful sandy beaches and exotic corals play a huge part in attracting tourists. It's the perfect place for snorkeling and diving down to explore the vivid, plentiful marine life. For water wimps like Hanan and I, the next best thing is to take to the seas in a handsome glass bottom boat so that we can float in a dignified fashion over the strange, curvaceous coral formations. The Gulf of Aqaba is host to about 110 species of soft coral, 120 species of hard coral, and over 1,000 species of fish. And look, there's goldfish. Look, and yellow fish. And a black one. Oh, look at the fish. How lovely. I guess they're used to having a boat swimming over them. Look at that one over there. The crystal clear waters, mild currents, and lack of stormy weather all work together to preserve Aqaba's coral reef. And sometimes there's even a helping hand from the monarchy. That's the tank that King Hussein um, dropped to encourage corals to, to grow. And as you can see, there's loads of corals growing on it. And the odd abandoned ship also helps the coral to flourish. Is it on its side? It is, it's on its side, isn't it? So this boat was kind of an abandoned boat that lost its us and they just decided to sink it. Oh, look, there's a diver there. Oh, look, there's a diver. <laughs> Regretfully, it's time to return to dry land and to negotiate this terrifyingly wobbly walkway. Woo, that is so weird. I'm not sure about this as a concept. What sadist came up with something like this? Give me planks and handrails any time. Yay, we made it. Dry platform. Hanan and I take refuge in the joyful mayhem of Aqaba Town's central souk. This busy souk is the beating heart of the town, with a splendid array of goods for sale from shoes to shark skulls. We're searching for the food and fresh produce area so that Hanan and I can cook up something sweet for lunch. Look, they've got all kinds of interesting greens. First on our shopping list is fruit. What do you look for in a good pomegranate? The red colour. Red colour, that's the key. Well, uh, I'm presuming it has to be firm as well. Gamda. Hard. Hard. Sugar. Egypt. Egyptian. It's sweet. Are you Egyptian? Yeah. Oh, that's why. <laughs> Next, we need some spices. And this little spice shop looks like one of the best. There's turmeric, chilies, galangal, and so much more. Look, 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 look over here. This I is, love um... <laughs> these. They're dried limes, aren't they? This is called Numi Basra, and this is the naturally dried version, whereas these are oven dried. That's why they're oh, black. Those are very dramatic. Wow. Smell, really smell. Beautiful oh, smell. Beautiful. Now, what very do you aromatic. use these for? You make it, you, you, if you want to turn anything into um, lemony, citrusy Ew. flavor, you use these. Beautiful. Mm. What else? Ah. Uh, well, yeah. And that is not saffron, <laughs> is it? This is Jordanian saffron. It's called osphor in Arabic. It's not really. Uh, it's, not it's not real what saffron, you know is it? saffron. No, I mean that's yeah. that, there's too much yellow in it for a yeah. start, and it looks slightly wrong. Isn't it? For a lot of um, people who travellers who are travelling in countries yeah. where they grow saffron, I think they get very excited and they when see they cheap see. saffron. Whoa! 
but it, it it's just not, can't be cheap. It's not. Real saffron, no. never cheap wherever you go. No. Does no. he have any nice cardamom? Cardamom? Just cardamom. Ah! Oh. When you sell it ground, or will it lose its flavour too much? I um, think whole. it's better if he, they grind it for us. It's oh, he's going to grind it? Yeah, he can yeah. grind it for you. This is what I love about these spice shops. Whatever you need can be ground to order, releasing the exotic scents ready to use. Right, we just need one last thing and we'll be ready to move on. <laughs> Aha, uh, rose water, that's just what we want. My worried. Worried okay. is flour, my is my, uh, water. Three down, two to go. Next, we're looking for rice. So right. which kind of rice do we need? There's so many. Yes, I think that's the one. That looks like this Egyptian one? rice. Yep. Look, so that's Egyptian rice. Looks short, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. Short grain. Yeah, that's like the one. Like pudding rice in the UK. Yeah. Bit like that. We've one last thing to track down, and it's nuts. Yes, there really is nuts. How have we got any pistachios? There's pistachios, pistachios here. Yeah. Yeah, those have got the shells on. You need to look up and see there are some more pistachios over there. Mm -hmm. And Halabi means they come from Aleppo. This is where all, most pistachios in this country comes from. So, um, how much do we need? About this much? Yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> as long as there's a few left for me to nibble on. <laughs> that's our shopping list all ticked off. Shukran. 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 Bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, Bye. Now all we need is somewhere to cook, preferably somewhere outdoors with a gentle breeze to keep us cool. If there's one pudding I like more than almost any other, it has to be rice pudding. I love rice pudding. And the great thing about it is that it can be very humble, the kind you just have for supper at home quietly one night, or even out of a tin if you're really slobby. And then it can be as grand as you like, grand enough for a beautiful setting like this. And Lan, what kind of rice pudding are we making? This is called the halabia. Right. Basically, it's rice pudding, Jordanian style. Fire ahead. What's first? Uh, the first thing we have to do is strain the rice that's been soaking for about half an hour. Short grain rice called Egyptian rice. So you half cook it in water first? Yes. Right. Before you get creamy or milky? Absolutely. <laughs> Um, I've noticed there's a pomegranate here, and I seem to recall that you might want some pomegranate seeds. Yes, is that right. It's a nice, it's a nice twist to it. There is no neat, tidy way to prepare a ripe pomegranate. It's simply a messy business. Here we go. The water is beginning to disappear, so now is a good time to lower the heat a little bit and add the sugar, add the milk. Excellent. You basically add milk as you see fit. Right. Really. Okay. The trick here is you have to constantly stir. Why is that? Because um, if you leave it for five minutes, the water would disappear and it'll burn. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have okay. st sticky pudding. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think I'm more or less done there. I've got absolute filthy hands. Now it's just a matter of waiting for the rice to cook. The idea is that it softens just about the same time as most of the liquid has been absorbed. Now Hanan adds the rose water. I use the top cap as a measure for one teaspoon. Mm -hmm. So long as you're That's consistent. All you need. Yeah, don't really need much. I love the smell of rose water. Yeah. It's like, mm, mm -hmm. let me smell. And, oh, um, it's like an Arabian night's boudoir. <laughs> mm. Mm. Sorry. Sorry, sorry about that. Away. And I'll put a little bit of hail, which is cardamom, inside, because I love it. Me too. But I know that here everybody loves in absolutely everything. No dish practically complete without a pinch or two or more of cardamom. Yeah, we use it for savoury rice as well as sweet rice. Is there anything I can do while we're waiting? Pistachios? Yeah. I'm greedy when it comes to pistachios. So leave some big chunks in okay. there for me. You can have this both warm or cold. So would you have Overnight. it chilled or just cold? It, 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 it's entirely up to you. There's right. no, there's there's no, no right or wrong. wrong. We're getting there. Helen, are my pistachios roughly to your liking? Too small, too big? That's fine. Thank you very much. Should I stop? Stop. That looks good enough for me. OK. It's an individual taste. You know, it's entirely up to you how you want to serve it. Now Hanan adds the finishing touches to her rice pudding. 
a few chopped pistachios, followed by a pinch of cardamom and a scattering of pomegranate seeds. Wow. Oh my golly gosh, isn't that so glam? Doesn't that look good? It looks divine, but how does it taste? Dig in. Will do. Mm. Mm. That is heavenly. That is so heavenly. You know, it does make me feel of princess-like, <laughs> ethereal. And it's hard to believe for me. But it just has that elegance and that scent. Oh, it's just gorgeous. Just gorgeous. Give me rice pudding <laughs> with pomegranates and pistachios and rose water any day. Suitably fortified, we head back on the tourist trail across Aqaba to its ruined castle. The history of this fortress goes back some 600 years or more, but the main edifice was constructed in the 16th century by the Mamluks. Stepping inside away from the heat, we enter a cool, shady entrance hall decorated with relief inscriptions. Gorgeous. What's that? This is Arabic writing. This is only part of a, one part of a sentence here. So that, that you, it's part of this block here and so on. Where you can stretch any of the Arabic writing to become really quite artistic to the point where you can't actually read it unless you knew. <laughs> According to scholars, this Arabic text states that the Mamluk Sultan Kansur al Ghuri is the fort's builder. The fort was designed to keep out marauders and to defend the coast. And when these massive steel doors were locked fast, it must indeed have seemed impregnable. For all that, centuries of fighting and neglect have taken their toll. But at long last, parts of the walls and cells have been reconstructed to give a hint of its original glory. It's huge, isn't actually, it? isn't it? Much yes. bigger than I expected. The most important thing about this fort is that it marks the turning point for the Great Arab Revolt. Faisal and T.E. Lawrence took back this fort from the Ottomans on the 6th of July, 1917. And this is why this fort is so important. Wonderful. To commemorate this triumph over the Ottomans, the Hashemite coat of arms was placed above the fort's entrance. So this place really was pretty large, wasn't it? I mean, there are rooms all the way down there, all the way down, on and on, towards the waterfront as well. Yes. Well, that's because at some point in time, it used to be a Hajj fort, a Muslim pilgrimage route, and it, people used to stay here on their way to and from Mecca. It's a great mm. view, too. But isn't it stunning? So yeah. what's that over there? That's Ilat over there. Oh, really? So that's Literally. Israel? Yeah, that's Israel. We share the port. And you also yeah. have a very, very big flagpole with no flag. It's laundry day. This flagpole was erected in the Great Arab Revolt Plaza to commemorate the revolt started in 1916. It's 130 metres high and the fifth tallest freestanding flagpole in the world. No flag today because apparently it is too windy. There's evidence of human habitation here dating back to 4000 BC. And the best place to get an idea of the sweep of Aqaba's early history is the small, beautifully designed archaeological museum. I'm fascinated by the development of pottery. And here, there's an impressive display of early Jordanian earthenware. Have you seen this? Look, Tupperware. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely nesting pots. How funny. But there's more than the odd shard of Chinese glazed plate and occasional stylish Nabataean bowl. Strange, tiny statues have been found amongst the ancient stones. Oh, that's Venus. That's a little Venus. Oh, yes, she is. She's rather sexy. <laughs> she is. Look, she's a little bit... Oh, and this beautiful uh, horse, it said. It's more like a dragon. Dog. OK, we're both totally wrong. <laughs> and here's proof that basic human nature never changes. Could this be a 6,000-year-old equivalent of a dirty magazine? Three guesses what that is. It might not be. It might... Uh, hold on. Female figurine... Oh, OK, it might be. Um, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. Lady of Akbar, made of baked clay. The figurine's head, the arms and the breasts are missing, <laughs> but the buttocks are just fine. <laughs> Enough saucy erudition. Time to plunge into the bustling world of modern commerce. Like all good tourists, I have a bit of a thing for tawdry souvenirs. Everywhere you go in Jordan, there are stalls selling sand art. 
Some are better than others, but the best are exquisite. This shop has a great reputation and heritage. Shakar Sahan is an award-winning sand artist who learned the trade from his father. As soon as I've jotted down my son's name, he sets to work. It is riveting to watch. First, the letters are written in glue. A quick swish of the black sand, Perfect. and there it Perfect. is, Sydney. Next, Shakar carefully spoons in different coloured sands and begins to build the desert landscape the camel caravan will be crossing. It's like painting with sand, isn't it? Shakar uses a fine metal rod to force the coloured sand into strange shapes which eventually, miraculously, transform themselves into camels. His concentration and patience remain unshakable throughout. Every time I think there's something just kind of going slightly wrong, it actually turns out it's absolutely on purpose. It's incredible. To finish, Shakar tamps the sand down tightly and seals the top with glue and a final dollop of sand. This is a really thorough job he's doing, isn't it? That's a lot of gluing and fixing. I'm going to be holding that upright all the way back home, on the aeroplane, on the coach, all the way back to the house. Oh, here you are, darling. You'd better be pleased with it. There's nothing like watching someone else working to stir up the appetite. So, souvenir in hand, we're heading off to the beach to admire yet another person slaving away on our behalf. So, Hanan and I have finally made it to the beach. Behind us, you can hear the Red Sea lapping gently against the sand. And the great thing about a sea is that it's full of fish. So Chef Fadi will be cooking fish. What are you going to cook for us? Samak harra. And what, what's that? Samak harra, it's fish spicy from Red Sea. First, some ripe, sweet, juicy tomatoes fall prey to Chef Fadi's speedy knife. So what else is going to go into this dish? Parsley, uh, garlic, hot pepper, lemon juice. You've got to have some olive oil in there, haven't you? Olive well? oil, yes. Yeah. yeah, I knew it. It's Jordan. <laughs> of course there's olive oil in there. One thing he didn't mention is the shafta. He has hot pepper sauce that goes into it. I love this chilli sauce. <laughs> I really, really love it. This is basically just uh, red peppers and olive oil. Finely chopped green chilli joins the tomato in the bowl, followed by plenty of garlic, a good handful of parsley and lemon juice. Then a sprinkle of salt, olive oil and plenty of pepper. This looks fantastic as it is. <laughs> you just eat it as a salad, really. Ah. The Finnish one. My favourite. Chatta, Arabic chilli. Once it is all nicely mixed together, it's time to turn to the fish itself. Not this one. Ours is lurking in the shadows. What kind of fish is this? Danny's fish. It's from Red Sea. Right. So he's filleting the fish along each side of the backbone. But it's interesting, he's not removing the head or the tail. No. Why are you leaving the head and the tail? A presentation, Ahla. For a presentation. I haven't got that one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's snipping out the backbone between the flesh. I've never seen this done before. That is fabulous. Can you see? Yeah, I'm Perfect. really impressed. Now a touch of fish origami. Oh, look at that. It's like a slipper. <laughs> that is amazing. Wow, well, that is great. Wow. Very nice. nice. Look at the little tail sticking up. Wow. Oh, I'm impressed. Oh, that is fabulous. I'm going to be practicing that when I get home. But of course, if you wanted to do something like this at home, you could, if you didn't feel quite up to the, the glamour of this, you could take ordinary fillets or a whole fish and pour it over, and it would still yes. taste brilliant. Yes. Now, I'm put it inside for oven, 30 minutes. An oven with a sea view. How cool is that? Half an hour's wait now, not too much of a hardship in this golden sunshine. It's had 30 minutes. Oh, hello. Whoa, whoa, whoa. It needs some decoration, coriander leaves. Never leave a dish without a garnish. Oh. Now it's ready. Oh, wow. that looks so Beautiful. good. And it smells. Mm. 
yes. Look, I'm going to try. Oh, let's see if we can get a bit of everything there. Yes. A bit of the fish, a bit of that lovely looking sauce. Golly, 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 that is just lovely. Oh. Nice fish, and the spiciness, perfect. The mm. fish is very sweet. It's got a not, but not just a lovely, lovely, fresh sea taste. And then the contrast with the tomato and the chili, the double ration of chilies, mm -hmm. just beautiful. You might think you'd lose the taste of the fish under that sauce. Not a bit of it. It's delicious. Thank you very much. I understand. Shukran. Malako. Thank you. You will come up with my pleasure. <laughs> this is lovely. With the evening gently easing in, Hanan dragged me away from the beach for one final treat. A horse-drawn carriage ride around the streets of Aqaba. Off we go. Whereabouts are we going? Um, it's a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> OK, we'll just enjoy it. I love being in one of these carriages. I know it's cheesy. <laughs> I know it's cheesy, but I can never resist them. Travelling by horse and carriage is a great way to meet the locals. Hello! Bye-bye! <laughs> but not such a good way to cut through traffic. Ah, oh, ah, oh, my God, we are in the middle of a three-lane road, right across it. Oh. Is that a normal way to drive? <laughs> From the vantage point of the open carriage, you get a warts and all view of the city. Do you know, I'm going to say something here that's a little bit mean on Akira, I think, that I thought it was going to be a bit more glamorous. <laughs> I love it, and I really like it, and it's got a great atmosphere, yeah. uh, and it's also fun on the beach and the but it's kind of a bit rough and ready. Yes, I mean, you have some very modern buildings as the banks. <laughs> the banks and the hotels. <laughs> and then you've got some really good old-fashioned buildings. So it's a mishmash. <laughs> Do you think Akamaya will change a lot over the next few years? I think so, yes. There's a lot of construction taking place. I hope they don't modernise it too much, though. Because it's got a character now. Yeah, and I think if it go too far right. and then modernise it, it could you know it could turn into something that could be anywhere. Yes, you're right. And this has got this has got plenty of character. As the light fades away, we trot on through Aqaba's boisterous streets. May the future never smooth out this rough-hewn gem, Imshallah. It's not the most glossy of resorts, but its salty, vibrant character more than makes up for that.